All right, so Rhyme Tovim, everybody, good afternoon. Uh, we want to welcome Dr. Mark Herman. He's making his debut on, on Torn Motion. It's a, a pleasure to welcome him. Uh, Dr. Herman is assistant professor at the Department of Humanities and a member of the Kashitsky Center for Jewish Studies at York University. If I'm not mistaken, you correct me if I'm wrong, you're basically taking the position that Dr. Marty Luxon had before he made Aliyah. He'll, of course, be giving the class tomorrow. I don't know, is that more or less correct? I try not to think of myself as filling any, any I, I'm any sorry, I, I meant that as a compliment. I meant that Dr. Luxon retired, <laughs> made Aliyah, and uh, they bring a young, nice, exciting uh, uh, professor. So it's really uh, um, a pleasure to have you. That's why he moved to Toronto, to a graduate of University of Pennsylvania, held fellowships at, at Columbia, Harvard, and Yale, Yale Law School, and served as a rabbinic intern at um, KJ Kellett Yisharun in um, in New York City and under, under Rabbi Lukstein, and it's a pleasure to welcome. And I guess I want to thank Mar Armachatanim from Allentown because because Dr. Herman spent some time in Allentown where Armachatanim live, and they were the ones who recommended that that we invite Dr. Herman to speak. And I'm sure you'll all understand why in a few minutes, and really to address a subject that I think many of us know very little about. And with that, Dr. Mark Vakasha, it's all yours. Thank you, Rabbi Kelman, and, and to Shira for coordinating for the invitation and the coordination. Um, I'm going to try and share my screen, um, which we had success at earlier. So let's see if it works. Uh, get some nods from whoever has their cameras on. Working, yeah. it's working fine. Yeah. Excellent. Okay, great. So um, Shira asked me to. Um, to tell everybody that I would try to be, I'd be, I'm open to people jumping in, having questions in the middle, and then more than happy to do that. I do have the chat open, and so I will try to keep my eye on that as well, although I can only look at so many screens at once, and I'll do my best. Um, and if people, obviously, it would be great if people could keep their cameras on, if at all I understand some people cannot, but if you can, um, that would certainly make for a more lively and participatory discussion um, as best as possible. So. Again, thank you to Rabbi Kelman for the invitation. Um, to Shira, I've heard a lot of good things about Torah in Motion, um, and I'm honored to, to, be, to be here today. Okay, so when Rabbi Kelman and I were discussing the options for, um, for this, this series, um, I, I think that there, there were a number of topics that came up, um, and what was exciting, perhaps, arguably, about the, about the Gaonic topic um, is that, as Rabbi Kelman said, it's really a very, very important period in Jewish history. Um, but it's arguably the one, only one that perhaps might need such a series, right? I think most sort of of the Torah in Motion audience, as far as I understand, probably knows the basic contours of maybe later medieval Jewish history, some modern period, certainly maybe if looking at the biblical period, rabbinic period, right? If we look at a lot of those sort of periods, we might not need such a broad introductory class as we would when discussing the Gaonim um, of, of, of Bavel, of Baghdad and Iraq in the 7th to 10th centuries, right? But um, as the Talmud tells us, right, everything is sort of dependent on luck um, or astrology, let's say. And we in certain periods just had happened to succeed and get more attention from um, interested uh, parties later in the day. And for lots of reasons, some of which we'll be able to discuss today, some of which we won't, the Gaonim did not quite succeed all the time in, the say, the contemporary Jewish consciousness in the same way um, figures like Maimonides or Ramban or Rashi, the Balei vote maybe have done. And for that reason, I guess we have two basic goals in mind, and they are um, should be pretty easy to remember because they are the title of this uh, this series. And um, the first is sort of discuss who the Gaonim were, um, who were these individuals, what were their academies like, how did they, um, where did they live, when did they live, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. And finally, um, and second. Why do they matter? So what? You know, there's a lot of periods of Jewish history. What was the contribution of the Gaonim in particular? Uh, and what did they what did they tell us about, about Jewish history? So before we even get into some of those basic, really big questions that we're going to talk about, um, I think it's probably safe to assume that the Gaonim are not entirely obscure. There are some Gaonic writings, um, of course, that I'm sure some or all of you will have heard of some or all of these works, right? Um, just to name a few, right? Um, one of them is the first major work of, um, of Jewish systematic theology, right? Sajiga owns um, Book of Beliefs and Opinions. So here's the tra in translation. Um, this translation was done by um, Samuel Rosenblatt in the first part of the 20th century. Um, it's still sort of the 
it's the only, as far as I know, the only full length English translation um, done from the Judeo-Arabic, the original Arabic language, right? A very important um, and influential work. And we'll talk more about that next week. Um, but there's also people who might be familiar with works like um, Halachot Kedolot, right? This major um, legal compendium, very influential, certainly among later um, Jews, particularly in Ashkenaz and elsewhere. Um, probably this time of year is when, when the Halachot Kedolot gets the most attention for um, the author's uh, famous or infamous position about Sfirah to Omer, right? Not for now, right? But this is certainly a very important, influential um, work from the Goanic period, although we'll talk about exactly its relationship to the Goanian, um, hopefully to the end, towards the end of today's class. Um, and just another example um, that people may have heard of um, is the Igeret of Shira Gaon, which we'll talk about in a couple of weeks at greater length. But this is the, translated as the epistle, the letter of um, Shira Gaon written um, towards the end of the 10th century, this very important um, statement of rabbinic history and Gaonic history um, that, let's say, influenced um, thinking about the rabbis, uh, that is the rabbis of the Talmud and the Mishnah, um, up until the 21st century, um, very important statement of rabbinic history. So, so certainly there are works that are familiar from the Gaonic period, not entirely obscure, but these are sort of a hodgepodge, um, certainly not, doesn't give us the full sweep of going activity intellectually, uh, communally, or otherwise. And also, if you um, are a denizen of the Beit Midrash, um, you may be familiar with this very, very important collection of Gonic writings, incomplete, as you can see here. Um, it only goes up to um, about half of the covering, about half the Babylonian Talmud. And, um, this is the Otsar HaGaonim by Binyamin Menashe Levin, um, who was a student of um, Rav Kook, died um, in 1944, and in keeping with certainly some of Rav Cook's ideas and other ideas that were in circulation in the first part of the 20th century, right, um, Levin what, uh, took upon himself to try and recover as best as possible at Gaonic literature. Um, this included Gaonic citations, citations of the Gaonim in, from later Rishonim, um, as well as um, newly published Gaonic writings, some of which from the Cairo Geniza and other manuscript findings um, that we'll talk about a little bit. Uh, Levin, which is a massive work, monumental accomplishment, is, has not been completed and only been taken uh, now and as we speak. Uh, Professor Robert Brody, who we will talk about, um, or at least encounter a lot of his writings for the rest of today, um, is and his sort of circle of students and um, colleagues have taken upon themselves to complete this work to cover the rest of the Babylonian Talmud. But this is a massive index of sort of every time Gonim talk about any um, passage or discussion in the Babylonian Talmud. The Gotsar, Otsar Gonim is a, a very, very useful work, um, but it's also a work that requires a little bit of um, initiation and guidance to understand fully. Um, and I would counsel anyone who has started um, whoever opens this work to really look at the footnotes to think about how Levin worked. Really, he's really collating um, Gonic sources and also a lot of non-Gonic sources, but anything sort of pre, um, pre-Maimonides um, in the, the Islamic world as much as possible that he could get together. So this is another perhaps um, set of writings. Obviously, Otsar Gaonim is something later assembled, but it's reflective of the Gaonic world. So the goal then in today's class, and then in this series as a whole, is to um, is the following. This is a four-part series, right? The, today, we're going to talk about sort of the, the basics, who the Gaonim were, what they did, um, where they lived, et cetera, et cetera. They're sort of, you know, who, what, where, when, why um, of historical data. And then I've sort of chosen three um, topics with covering four different figures um, who are representative not of the Gonic period as a whole, but only of the second half or the, la the latter period of, the of Gonic history. Um, that is Sadi Gaon, who we already mentioned a little bit, uh, Shrira and his son Haya, who we talked about a little bit as well. And finally, Shmuel ben Khafni, who is a figure who's more obscure, but um, hopefully that will come to an end on May 31st. A very important and interesting um, Gonic figure. But these figures are all towards the end of the Gonic period. Um, and that is the reason we're focusing on these individuals is because we can't really say a lot about so many previous, um, so many Gonic figures prior to the, eighth or, the ninth or 10th, early 10th century. That is, Sadia really inaugurated a new stage in Gonic history, um, invigorating the Gonic institutions and Gonic Baghdad intellectually and otherwise. Um, the earlier figures were, are somewhat more obscure with the exception of maybe Natranaga Owen and some others, um, but basically a lot of, I wouldn't, I would say the list is very, very short of pre-Sadia figures who we could offer an entire class upon. Um, 
so the, we, the really the topic of the, the structure of these lectures really reflects the data and sort of, and probably also um, to a large extent the uh, contributions of um, at least individuals in the Gaonic period as well. So all right, that's our big broad introduction. The first thing that the, what we have to do next is think about who the Gaonim were um, and what they what they did and where where they where they lived and when about when about when that might have happened. So obviously before we figure out the uh where who and uh, where they lived and when they lived let's just talk about the title gaon right and um, if i were to ask most people today right the term gaon refers to sort of any talmudic genius um you know you might people might think of the gaon mi vilna the gara um who was a you know the, a major torah figure in the 18th century um people might use this term for other rabbinic luminaries um in the 19th and 20th century right and that is um, in keeping with this idea that the gaon means you know, brilliant or excellent or, you know, maybe very smart person, right? But the um, title, the, the, the formal title Gaon is actually, um, for our period, needs to be used much more narrowly, not for any rabbinic figure of the um, 10th or 11th centuries, not even for any rabbinic figure in, the, in, um, in Baghdad in this period, but really for just the head of the, of the Gaonic academies themselves. And here you see, um, and we'll do a lot, hopefully, some nice pretty pictures, Today and in, in coming weeks, um, a, a, a manuscript of a of a response um, of a question uh, posed to Shri Gaon. And here you see um, the phrase um, "Rosh Yeshivat Gaon Yaakov." Right. This this question. Then we'll read this. We'll read this in a second. Was posed to Shri in his capacity as the head of the yeshiva of Gaon Yaakov. That is the pride of Jacob. Right. The, therefore, the title of the yeshiva is Gaon Yaakov, uh, uh, and he is the Gaon, that is the head of that of that institution. So it's, let's just read this um, response him together, and we will get a little bit of a sense of what um, what is going on here. Um, this these kind of questions preserve a lot of information that we will sort of milk um, to the best of our ability. So I mean, I know probably a lot of not a lot of people have read manuscripts together, but this is actually a fairly easy um, one to read, um, and I will translate as we go. So starting at the very beginning of the first line, um, you will notice that the Aleph and the Lamed are often smushed together. Um, and what um, academics like to call a ligature, um, but we could just call it uh, two smudged letters. Um, but the question began, right? The question was asked, right? The, at the question was asked at the, at the gate um, or the entrance to the academy of the exile. So the question was asked of the high court. This is not just any high court, but this is taking on the, the title, Beitin Hagadol, that might be familiar um, in rabbinic descriptions of the Sanhedrin. That is, the Gaonim were saw themselves and carried themselves as the leaders of the Jewish people intellectually and religiously. Adonenu Shrira Rosh Yeshivat Gaon Yaakov. And that's the, um, the highlighted phrase Chamud Adonenu Hananya Rosh Yeshivat Gaon Yaakov, right? The beloved of, meaning probably descendant of, um, and therefore and son in this case, of um, the previous or a, a previous Rosh Yeshivat Gaon Yaakov. Um, and then so this question was asked of Shira, right? And then, it, then the question continues. ki katva yishma eli. And since the questioner wrote his question in the language of Ishmael, that is Arabic, af anu tzivinu lahashiv chuvoteha bilshon yishma eli. That we too have decided to answer the question in the language of the Ishmaelites, that is Arabic. And then... Um, you, they, they, there's a little break in the manuscript, and then the continue, question continues about in, I'm not in Hebrew, but in Judeo-Arabic, that is in Arabic and Hebrew letters, um, a language we'll talk about a little bit more towards the end. But so here we see a lot, we can get a lot from just this question, right? We, get, we got the title of Rosh Hashibat Gaon Yaakov, right? We got this idea that um, people are speaking in Arabic, and also that they, whenever the Gaonim were asked a question, they would be asked they would answer in the, in the language of the questioner, which in this case was not Hebrew, but Arabic, reflecting a lot about, um, about medieval, about Gaonic um, Jewish society. Um, if, similarly, we look at this manuscript, which is a little bit harder to read. Um, so I've given you the printed edition here. Um, and here you see again, um, Shrira Rosh Yeshivat Gaon Yaakov, another question to Shrira. Excuse me, the mentioned Shrira, this one is to his son. Hi Gaon, hi Gaon, uh, should be properly Asked, right, and you see again, and here we're just reading from the transcription from Asaf. Um, um, blah, 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 blah. These questions were asked of the um, 
academies. And here is the um, here's the question that was posed. Okay, so what I wanted to get from these questions, there's a lot to be gleaned from just the questions, but it's important to see here that this title Gaon does not just mean brilliant person, does not just mean you know any Jew before the time of Rashi, any rabbi before the Rashi, where oftentimes in um, Informal parlance, will people refer to um, leaders of North African Jewry as Gaonim or other figures like that? Properly speaking, the term Gaon only refers to the head of the academies in Baghdad. Okay, so that's our that's what we're looking for, trying to situate these these individuals. So what was what was the world in which the Gaonim found themselves? So if we were to zoom back a little bit in Jewish history, right before what we like to call the Gaonic period, the world, the, not just the Jewish world, but obviously the Jewish world along with it, was really divided. I mean, to two major dynasties, right? On the one hand, in the East, um, you had the Persian Sassanids, and in the West, you had the Byzantine, Eastern Roman Christians, right? This was up until the world about the, the sixth century, and this was the world that produced um, the two Talmuds, right? That we have the Talmud of Eretz Israel, right? And the Talmud of Babel, right? They were produced in these competing different societies. Um, but, but sort of unexpectedly, obviously there was a major change in world events, um, and out of the Arabian Peninsula, um, rapid with you know rapid and sunny expansion came the uh, these the, the conquering Muslims who conquered um, basically the entire Jewish world, with the exception of um, of what we like to call Ashkenaz, you know, Italy north of Sicily. That is the Jewish world instead of being divided into two societies, right? The, Persians and the Byzantines, are the, you know, who are constantly doing battle, instead now is united under one world, that is the Abbasids, who were the, um, the regnant Muslim dynasty um, in the ninth and 10th centuries, right? So these, this Jewish world was now united under one group. And here in this map, you see the major, um, basically every major center of the Jews in the Islamic world, as far west as uh, the Pyrenees, I mean, and the Jewish world certainly continued well into Persia um, in this period, if not beyond, although that is a little bit more obscure. But the point is, for the Ga'onim and for the leaders of, of these religious communities, right, we now had, instead of having two worlds that were divided linguistically, divided culturally, we have one much larger world that's connected um, through language, trade, and other forms of communication, travel, and, uh, and whatnot, right? You could send letters from one end to the other. You could communicate, and this really enabled the Gonic Academies to put their fingers in a lot of pies and to reach out as broadly as possible in order to propagate, promulgate the Judaism that they advocated for. Um, and if we zoom in a little bit in the on this map, right, we generally think of the world of the Gonim centered here in, in um, some cities that are probably from, almost definitely familiar to everyone on this Zoom, right? Here is, um, you know, Iraq, Jordan, contemporary Israel. Did we lose Dr. Herman? Everything's gone, eh? Uh, we can hear you, but not him. Okay, so it looks like he left, and so hopefully he'll come back momentarily. Meanwhile, you can pick up where he took. <laughs> Ruth? <laughs> Sure, and then he just stopped. His, his voice stopped. He was, yeah, that was bro, that, that, that happened lovely. quite suddenly. So hopefully, that just that maybe maybe he got kicked out of Zoom real quick for some reason, and he should, I hope, come right back. Does he know how to get that? Yes, yes, he'll just log back in. And in the meantime, why don't I tell you about uh, a class we have tomorrow with Dr. Malka Simkovic? So one shot, yeah, that's going to be several classes, so. 
Yes, it is only a one-time class with Dr. Malka. Tomorrow is Thursday, and it'll be right after um, it'll be right after Dr. Lakshan's class. So if you're coming to Dr. Lakshan, you can just stay on. Shira? Yeah, Anyone? very strange, very strange. Hey, oh, right. Yeah, 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 yeah. Okay, good. All right, I apologize for that. A bit of technical problem on my end. Um, let me uh, pull ourselves up. Are we back? You are back. All right, I have no idea what just happened, um, but let me... Uh... Kapara, Kapara. <laughs> Hopefully. All right, we were over here, if I remember correctly. Is this familiar to everybody? Yes. Great. Please repeat. Uh, what you okay. Said. I apologize. I hope that it does not happen again, but I make no promises to any on te any technological end. Um, okay. Are we? But I just want to confirm that everyone can see and etc. And we were here, right, in this discussion of um, the two centers of the Jewish world. You had not quite started it. Okay. Great. So I will zoom back a little bit. Right. I, um, I just said, we just decided, I just decided, talked about how the Jewish world was really divided, was all of a sudden united in the major centers, right? And when we think of the Gonic world, we tend to think of the Middle East, um, that is um, the two academies in um, Eretz Israel and Babel. Um, and I, I will just, I think I said this, I'm not sure where, where it was cut off. Um, there were, even though there was rabbinic learning in both centers, Right, um, scholars today are a little more skeptical about how exact, how strong, um, and certainly at an earlier date before the 10th century, let's say, um, the academies were in Eretz Israel. Right, the evidence um, is not super so robust um, to support the idea that were really two centers, at least before the 10th century, before the time of Sadia, maybe a little bit before that. Um, there was clearly rabbinic learning, but they weren't as in Eretz Israel wasn't as robust as. And certainly in Baghdad and, and Iraq. And this um, sort of reconsideration that hasn't quite taken hold among scholars, but I think um, is quite compelling on a lot of fronts, um, really it helps explain the fact that we don't have a lot of literature from, um, from Eretz Israel, writers living in the land of Israel um, in this period, right? What we do have, we, we have Midrash, we have Pew, but we don't have a lot of halakha, and, and, it, and really the history of rabbinic learning and, and the history of the Jerusalem Talmud and its reception um, and promulgation before the turn of the millennium is um, convoluted um, and mysterious um, and lacking a lot, of, a lot of support. So for that reason, um, when people take to speak about the Gaonim, now I've, I have tried to winnow our discussion quite significantly, right? Instead of speaking the Gaonic period or covering all rabbinic figures all across the world, in the, so in the Islamic world in the 10th, 11th centuries, we've now zoomed into um, just the heads of the academies, not just the not just the heads of the academies in the Middle East, but really, properly speaking, the Gaonic period and the world of the Gaonim focuses on the Gaonim of Babel, and, and most especially um, the Gaonim of Baghdad, certainly at um, some point in the late 9th century, um, you can see here on this map, they're obscured a little bit by the circles. We have these cities of Pompadita um, and Sura, right? Um, which, which people may have may be familiar with, right? These are the names of the two Gaonic academies, um, Sura and Pabadita, which have their roots, um, although they're a little bit, of, it's not entirely clear the link to um, Talmudic era institutions. Um, and they're sitting on these two great rivers, um, very close to Baghdad. Did the um, uh, ba Babylonian Gaonim Ga know Yerushalmi, the Talmud Yerushalmi? Hold that question. He's left the room again. Did the Babylonian Talmud, did the yeah, Babylonian in, in, in the ninth century, um, dates are still um, a little fuzzy. Um, these are in Baghdad. It certainly attracted a lot of intellectuals um, and other leaders. Um, and, and certainly the rabbinic um, elite became, had moved with their academies, um, you know, to the capital city, as opposed to living, you know, let's say in Lakewood, New Jersey, they moved to, uh, to Washington, D.C. To Washington, D.C. Okay. So what could is clarify the yes. period? Could you clarify the years, the period? Yes, we will get we're getting there right now. It's a good good question. Okay. So oftentimes when people losing it again. 
Gershon, the uh, Babylonian Amoraim knew the Israeli Amoraim. They always talk about what are they, what what is what is happening in Ma'arav in the West. So they did have contact with them. But there was Ula. They they they, uh, they needed travelers to uh, to bring the information. So it was not universally known. I think. Right. It wasn't like it is today. Yeah. But somehow the Gaon period it changes. That's another thing we have to find out. Why is it that the Gaon period contact with Eretz Israel scholars seems to be hostile rather than collaborative? And people are writing books saying what you know what trash is coming out of Eretz Israel. Their halacha is no good. Their shiva is no good. You know, um, in other words, the, the relationship is no longer friendly and uh, intersecting. It's more hostile. And I, I sort of hope someone's going to, we're going to get an explanation of that for more. All right. Is, I, I, I am back now. I apologize again for this. Um, I have switched Wi Fi networks. I think Rogers might be working on my street, which has caused me to have other um, problems in the past. And here, and so I've decided to not. Use the. I'm just using my my cell phone. Hopefully, this won't be um, this, this. We won't get kicked off again. I very much apologize for this. Are people back? Um, can see the screen. Yeah. What? No. no. I don't see the screen. No screen. I don't see you either. All we see is like the shot yeah. of a model of the person. Now we don't see how yeah, we see. All right, I'm back again. I really hope this works. I'm very, very much apologize for this. We can see you now. Yeah, we see okay. you. I'm very sorry. I have no idea why this is happening. Um, I'm trying my best to overcome the technological difficulties with my own limited abilities when it comes to this stuff. Um, okay, are we? Well, let's move forward, hoping this is the end of the of the of the problems. Okay. So someone asked me just now when the Gonic period was, um, as we, and I mentioned that the historians like to sort of poo-poo this idea of periodization, that is to dividing his, history into periods, um, but it certainly can be helpful in some, in some circumstances. Um, and when thinking about the Gonim, it's, you know, there's plus and minus to this, but let's sort of talk about when this period might've begun and when it might've ended. Here you see on the left, um, a list of, uh, Jewish thinkers, let's say um, in Hebrew with the Gonim sort of after the Talmudic period before the Rishonim, the medieval, later medieval thinkers. And I just grabbed this timeline from um, Wikipedia, uh, not because it's right or wrong, but because it's sort of representative, I think, of what most people uh, probably imagine themselves. That is sort of after the Talmud, there's this ambiguous period of Sephora'im, which we'll talk about in a second. Then we have the Gonim and then um, the Rishonim and Afronim, sort of the middle, the early ones and the late ones, um, if you will. Okay. so. The most important source, as I mentioned, for the Gaonic period, um, that is how the Gaonim saw themselves and how the, Go how the Gaonim sort of situated themselves in the timeline of Jewish history is um, the letter of Shira Gaon, um, which we'll talk about more in a couple of weeks, um, but it is a very, very important source. Here you see one, um, one important manuscript of this text, right? Um, B'Shem Hashem, um, Kel Olam, right at the beginning, right? And you see the question asked of Shira was, was Ketzad Nichtava Hamishnah, Right? How was um, the Mishnah written? Written down. That is, that's a very important word. Written down. Um, Talif, a, a, a book by Moreno, Rabbeinu Shira Gaon, Habadol, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. Right? And here you have the entire question in this manuscript. Um, and Shira's uh, letter sheds a lot of light on how the Gaonim saw themselves and how they thought of themselves in transition and distinguishing from earlier periods in Jewish history. Right? Um, and so, if you look in Shira's letter. Um, you see a number of comments about the beginning and end of the, of the Talmud, right? Which obviously the Talmud has to end for the Gonim to start. Sure, ends this, um, sure discusses this at, you know, on more than one occasion. And so I, I would like to read a couple of quotations for you, for you so we can understand where Shira thought and this will help us situate the Gonim chronologically as well. So um, Shira discusses the beginning and the end of the Talmud and he writes as follows, right? In this manner, Hora'a, that is instruction, insight, um, rulings, authoritative rulings, was added generation after generation until Ravina. That is, the way that 
rabbis thought about themselves and functioned in a rabbinic capacity continued until Rabina, right? Rabina is a late, but one of the latest named figures in the Babylonian Talmud. And when she writes this hora'ah, this unique level of instruction was discontinued. And how do we know this um, according to Shriya? Why do we know that Ravina is the end? So as Shmuel Yerchana saw in um, what is translated here as the book of primor primor primordial Adam, right? The Sifro, the Adam Harishon, right? This is a, a, a mysterious book that's mentioned in the Babylonian Talmud in a couple of places. This book apparently said, Ashi and Ravina, the end of Hora'a, right? They're the end of instruction. Something has changed in how rabbis are supposed to work after. So therefore, Shira tells us the Talmud properly ends with these figures, Ravina and Rav Ashi, right? Sometime in the sixth, in maybe the fourth, fifth centuries, right? And after this, Shira writes, certainly, although there was no Hora'a, there were explanations and opinions approximating to Hora'a, right? It wasn't quite as good, but people still continued, tried their best thereafter. And, and those mas masters were called the Rabbanan Savora'e. They were the Savora'im, these anonymous figures um, who were not quite as good as the real Talmud people, but they still contributed something. And he says that whatever had been left hanging, these rabbis, the Savora'im, made it explicit. That is, they contributed to the text of the Talmud as we have it, um, uh, Shreya tells us, but they didn't quite have the same caliber of Jewish learning as some of the earlier, um, as some of the earlier, you know, real authorities in the Talmudic history. Um, and similarly, so now he gives us some couple names here. This is um, a few pages later, right? And, and they, these rabbinic, these sabbaraim, um, and also succeeding rabbis such as Rabbi e Eina and Rabbi Simuna, I mean, figures we don't have any information who they were, but these were apparently named figures in the sabbaraic period incorporated several opinions of in the Gemara. That is, the Sepharaim contributed to the Talmudic text that we have today, right? Shura is telling us. And we have a tradition from the earlier authorities, that is, Shura is saying, I, I've been told by my teachers, 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 whatever it was, that the Gemara at the beginning of Aisha Nignate, that is the beginning of Kiddushin, which Davyomi will start in a week or so, right? Until with money, how do we know this? There's the whole first part of the first couple of pages of the tractate Kiddushin was redacted and incorporated by the later Rabban and Sivarai and other passages as well. So Ravina uh, Shura tells us that Sivarai had some role in the shaping of the Talmud, even contributed several pages of discussion and maybe other discussions as well. But we don't know their names and their, and their learning wasn't quite as good. So, so according to Shura then, we have the Talmudic period that formally ends with Hora'a ending with Ravina and Ravashi. Then we have the Sivarai'im, right? And then comes um, the end of that. So he, and this is what he says. So afterwards, Rav Asi reigned, and in his day was the end of Hora'a and the Talmud was sealed. Right? That was the end of, of Talmudic learning. Um, and then, and, and, and there were then the Rabbanan Sabra'i, the Sabra'im, this in-between period. Most of them died within a few years. So according to, according to Shriya, this is a brief period. For the earlier authorities stated thus in the Book of Remembrance of Events, we have no idea what this book is. Shriya is referring to some document that he had. In Sivan of the year 815, that is 504 of our calendar, Rav Sama, son of Rabbanan, Ju Judah died, and they say that he was Abitin. So we have some sort of information about these figures in the sixth, early sixth century. And then Rashi, and then, um, and then Shura tells, and they were years of persecution and troubles at the end of the Sasanian monarchy. And they were, and they, that is the rabbis, were unable to establish Pirke, that is public lectures, and convene the academies and conduct the customs of the Gaonate un until a number of years had passed. And the rabbis of our academy, from Petit, um, came from Petit to the neighbor, neighborhood of Naharda to the city of Pira Shabur, right? So these are all places in, in, um, in and around Baghdad um, that we saw on the map earlier. But what we hear from, what we see from this text and the way we're, uh, Shur is constructing this history, right, is that we have a certain period of Talmudic learning that continued um, until about the sixth century, right? And then there was a what Shur calls a brief period of Sabaraim, which is anonymous, he claims there were a lot of persecutions. And then it sounds like only after the Sabaraim ended did the Gaonic period begin, right? Whatever that means. But the, there was some sort of the most important thing here for the Gaonic self identity is apparently their decision to no longer shape, give shape to the Talmud. That is, the Talmud was closed by Ravina and Ravashi and Hora'a, whatever that is, and the Sabaraim. And then once they stopped adding to that text, then the Gaonic period. Begin. So then we're talking maybe beginning of the sixth, seventh century, right? These early figures, as I mentioned, are very obscure. Okay, so that's sort of the beginning of when the Gonic period may have 
begun. What about the end? So this too is um, tied up with a lot of politics um, and some other interesting discussions. So here we have a passage from um, a work known as the Sefer HaKabalah, um, the book of that's not Kabbalah in the uh, mystical sense, but Kabbalah in the sense of tradition by um, the 12th century Andalusian author, Avraham Ibn Daoud. Um, sometimes you will see um, Ibn Daoud referred to as Ravad number one um, to distinguish him from two Provencal figures, Ravad number two and Ravad number three. Um, I prefer to use the name Ibn Daoud just to not um, sort of reduce the number of times we have to say this uh, acronym, but Ibn Daoud was a, an older contemporary of Maimonides, an important Aristotelian philosopher, maybe the first major Jewish Aristotelian. Um, and in addition to his interest in science and philosophy, he also wrote um, what today is considered an important um, look back on Spanish Jewish history. Um, and, but in order to get to the Jews of Spain, in order to account for Jewish tradition, he needs to give an entire account of um, the earlier periods as well. And one of the things he's most interested in is, I don't need, um, want to volunteer, I just want, does anyone want to volunteer to read this passage for us in English? Just to give, us, give me a, here, have someone else talk? I will. Please. Okay. Uh, when Shrira saw that his life was prolonged and that his son, Rav Chai, was worthy of being head of the academy, he stepped down in favor of his son. The latter was Rav Chai Gaon, Bar Rav Shrira Gaon. He spread Torah abroad throughout Jewry more than all the other Gaonim, and by his light walked those who sought Torah from east and west. After living for 99 years, he passed away on the eve of the last day of Passover in the year 1349, is that right? Of the, yep, of the Seleucid era, that is Seleucid what we era. call Minyan Shtarot. <laughs> right, which is equivalent to uh, 4798 or 10, is that 88, 38? That's, that's 38, that's a three. Okay. Uh, the Gaonim, yeah, thank you. Of the Gaonim before him, there was none like him. And he was the last of the last, the great of the last, last of the last Gaonim. Right. <laughs> so here we have, sure, um, even Daoud telling us that Haya and Shriya were excellent thinkers, but when Haya died, that was it. That was the end of the Gaonic period. Right. Obviously, someone writing in Al Andalus in Jewish Spain is invested in this idea that you know Baghdad is no, no longer in charge. And this statement and others of Shrira, really, uh, uh, excuse me, of even Daoud in the 12th century in Spain, tell us that Spain is claiming put, is putting itself on a pedestal over over Baghdad. But it sort of gives a sense of the Jewish, and this is the idea. I think most people would tell you Haiga was the last go own. Um, obviously, things are a little more complicated than Ibn Daoud led on, and Ibn Daoud even tells us um, that tells us as much himself. So, do you want it, someone? Um, I, it was Dr. Lancaster. Do you want to read this last? This yes, quotation I would. I'd, love, from to, Ibn I'd Daoud? love to read it. Yes. When Sharira saw that his life was prolonged, oh, and the that next, his sorry, son... the next paragraph. The next paragraph. Oh, I'm sorry. The members of Rabbi High's academy appointed Hezekiah the exilarch, the grandson of David ben Zakkai in the sea of Rabbi Hai of blessed memory. He served for a term of two years. Then informers denounced him to the king and the latter imprisoned him, put him in chains, tortured him grievously and left no survivors. After Hezekiah the exilarch and head of the academy, there were no more acad academics or go on him. Okay, so we see here um, an interesting story, not for now, but it, we see here from even Ibn Daoud is telling us that you know, I said a few pages ago that Hai Gaon is the last of the Gaonim, but you know what? There were actually other figures after him. So what is going on here is that this end, quote unquote, end of the Gaonic, quote unquote, period is a lot more complicated than even Daoud wants to let on. And this tells us, obviously, that as with any periodization, right, the end of a period is going to be uh, right with politics. It's never going to end, you know, on a dime, never cleanly. It's always going to be messy, um, and there's always going to be gray period um, in between. But what's interesting, especially, is that we sort of have now the good definition of how to think about the Gaonim. Obviously, the Gaonim saw themselves as no longer contributing to the Babylonian Talmud, right? Doing a different task that was different from Ravina and Rav Ashi, different than Sabaraim. And this ended at some point when the Gaonim um, 
So when Baghdad lost its prestige, even though there may have been figures even as late as the 12th century who claimed the title Gaon in Baghdad, nevertheless, um, sort of by the first part of the 11th century, the Jewish world at least tried to move on from Gaonic authority. Okay, so what were the, what did these Gaonim do? Uh, there's a lot to say about the Gaonic role, and I've sort of tried in the next few slides, I want to show you a few um, important contributions I think the Gaonim made to in, in their day. Um, and we'll sort of this give, give us a sense of maybe the second part of our question is so why the Gaonim matter um, and why they matter continually to this day. So here you see um, not a picture of the Gaonic Academy, but a reconstruction of the Yeshiva of Rav Ashi, right? This is a um, an artistic work that's in Beit HaTzfutzot in Tel Aviv, right? And what's going on here is we have these, you know, great instructors uh, ten, teaching 10 rows of 70 students, right? That's the Sanhedrin in the beginning of this instruction, surrounded by many, many more students, right? This ideal, idyllic picture of the um, academies in, in, in Baghdad, right? And this idyllic picture is not a modern artistic reconstruction, but in fact is drawn from another important source of Gonic history, although, um, a controversial one and something that needs to be uh, used with caution. This story um, from Natan Habavli of the 10th century. Natan Habavli wrote this book, um, the, the, this history of Baghdad, or the story of Baghdad to an audience of North African Jews, trying to emphasize the greatness of the Gonic Academy. So we have to be a little skeptical about all of his details, but some of the so sources that he brings are, um, some of the claims that he makes do, um, do carry some weight. So one of the descriptions that he gives um, which it's hard to know what to make of um, if this was always the case or just the ideal situation, right? Um, but he tells us the following. He says there are seven, and the seven are called the heads of rows, that are seven rows. And it sometimes happens that others are greater than them in wisdom, that is, the, these heads, not because they're excellent, but because they've inherited their father's ranks, right? They're not appointed because, but they just, it's inheritance. For if one of the heads of rows has died, let the son keep up in his place, he is appointed, right? So this is a very sort of a brief snippet of Natan Ababli's a description of the Gonic Academies and Gonic learning. But what we have here is this idyllic picture that the Gonim are teaching this massive bo student body that resembles as best it can the, the Sanhedrin, right? And so this, we, we, even if we can't accept all the details of Naktan's account, it certainly speaks to the fact that the Gonim were try, did their best to transmit the Talmud, and we'll see this uh, more in, in coming weeks. That's one, I think, important activity of the Gonic period, right? Obviously, the Talmud has to get from Baghdad to the entire Jewish world. And the way that it did that, at least at first, appears to have been through the Gonic academies one way or another. Another important um, element of Gonic authority is the competition of responsa, right? We, the institution of writing responsa dates, as far as we can tell, earliest recordings, is not from the Gonic period, but already in the Babylonian Talmud. We have reports of responsa, but the first compilations, the first um, responsa at any length really come from the Gonic period. I mean, here you see on the right, you see a picture of one relatively lengthy document preserved in the Cairo Geniza um, of one Gonic uh, chuva, right? And but when we open these two boats, we do get a little bit of a sense of how the Gaonim worked, right? And here, this line is not from the picture. I apologize. I couldn't get the manuscript of this text. Um, I looked for it. It didn't um, come as readily as I, as I wanted it to. Um, but here we have a line in, tucked away in one of the chubot of Rav Natrunai Gaon, so a pre sadia figure, and he tells us the following in the course of a much larger discussion. So he tells us, Marav Simunai agreed with him, that is, with the previous opinion, and the reason that he did not write to you is that he was not the head, he was not the Gaon, but re rather just the, the Reish Kala, the, the term that seems to, to, to mean the head of one of those rows. That is, he was a more junior member of the academy, and he, this guy, this individual, Rav Simunai, did not write a chuva because he was not a Gaon, which tells us that who was responsible for writing these chuvot? The Gaoni. So the major, um, there, there may have been some input from those around him, from this Gaon, but at the end of the day, the Gaon was speaking and writing on his own behalf and on his own ultimate authority as vested at, in him at, by dint of being the head of the institution, right? And you see similar ideas um, here. Does someone want to uh, read this? Um, this rather important chuba from Amram Bar Sheshna, um, another maybe seventh, eighth century figure. Um, someone who wants to take this for me in English. All right, I'll take this one. Amram Great. Ben 
Okay, Amram ben Sheshna, head of the academy at Mata Machatsia, which is Sura, to all yeah. the yeah. To all the rabbis and their students and the rest of our brothers among the Jewish people dwelling in the country of Barcelona. Accept greetings from So he is writing from he is writing from Iraq all the way to the other end of the Jewish world in Spain. In Spain. Accept greetings from me and from Sema Ben Paltoy, the assistant dean of the academy, and from the leading sages, and from all the scholars here in the place of the great Sanhedrin, and from my colleagues who are in the place of the lesser Sanhedrin, and from the rest of the scholars, and the Tanim, and the scholars gathered here at this seminary. As for the questions that you pose before us, we have noted and read them before us in the presence of the head of the academy and the best of scholars and all the pupils. We have studied them and we have examined what was written in them, and thus we have been instructed from the heavens, but no answer. Okay, so here we have a rather lengthy introduction to um, a, to a to to vote, right? And where that shed light on how the Gonim sort of position themselves, right? We are representing the Sanhedrin. We've thought about these questions, not just myself, as we've studied all the issues, we've, we're instructing you from this sort of great center of Jewish learning, right? And obviously the Jews in Barcelona and many, many other places would write to the Goni for their questions, right? Some of the questions you can tell are rather basic, right? Amram Sheshna is, is credited with putting together the first Sidur, right? That's a rather, we would, I think, consider a rather basic question. But if you look in other um, Gonic responsa, you see more advanced questions that represent serious thinking and learning from not, um, from more, from people we recognize as Talmudic Fachamim um, and people who would have um, contributions to say, maybe in the Torah discussions. Um, and, but on all these figures, the Gonim claimed and uh, put themselves forward as these authorities. So that this is an important way the Gonim um, maintain their activity. And if you were to open Levin's Otsara Gaonim, you get a real sense of how much of the Gaonic literature, certainly before Sadia, is really comprised of these, um, of these responsa. Okay, so the Gaonim obviously would often send these responsa in bundles um, at, to different centers in the Jewish world. And here you see, um, over time, there were attempts to assemble them uh, into coherent books, right? They would send them in groups, and then oftentimes later figures would look back and say, how do we put these things together? And here you have a, um, a document from the Cairo Benisa that is quite clearly a um, table of contents, right? Um, so the, uh, some of these are, and they're, they're on all sorts of discussions, right? So um, I don't I don't know if I know how to use the pointer here. Let's see if I can figure this out. Um, so people can see this, right? So here we have Amavoy Sheino Mufulash. This is a question about Masef um, Eruvin. Right here we have um, nasa isha umate, right? So he his uh, someone died, someone married a wife and, 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 and he died, right? Probably a financial question, maybe a question about you, etc. Cetera, etc. Cetera. But these are what these documents show. Obviously, this is part of a much larger collection. You could tell from the way the document is put together um, that this was part of a book. This in the middle, the page, pages folded over, right? And there would we have it therefore at least four sides of paper if, and probably tied together to, to create a list of responsa. They were collected about the Gaonim. So the response would be dispersed, and later people would assemble them. Uh, many of these people are anonymous, but some of them actually are not. And if you look here, I've brought to you a passage from the Ramban that is in the 13th century in Spain, writing um, in his, his, his um, famed Milchamot Hashem, it's one of his first commentaries on Babylonian Talmud. And when he tells us the following, he saw, he says, we saw Rabbi Judah, that is um, Judah ben Barzillai, our, our Barzillai, an important late 12th um, late 12th, late 11th century um, figure, late 11th century figure um, in, in Spain. And so this Al-Barzaloni was an expert in the words of the Gonim, which were always on his table. And he wrote such and such a version of the Talmudic discussion. What the Ramban is hinting at here is that figures like um, Judah, Bar Al Al Judah Bar Barzilai and others of in beyond, outside, in other communities in the Jewish world would collate Gonic writings in manuscripts like we see in front of us. And they would produce massive collections of responsa in which that would help share Gonic insights um, much broadly and promulgate them and put them together. So this is another important, obviously the Gonim didn't quite do all this work themselves, but this was an important reflection of the importance of their responsa um, in the promulgation of Jewish law. All right, another important contribution that the Gonim made I um, mean, not just the Gonim, but other people in their, in their day, was 
this idea that we should start setting forward rules for adjudication. That is, in the Babylonian Talmud, right, in other rabbinic literature, it's full of debates. So the question arose, not first in the Gothic period, but first probably um, in, in the Amoraic period, how does one rule in cases of dispute before other figures, right? And so what we have in the Gaonic period is the beginning of collections of rules. So some of them, uh, some of these rules are found in the Talmud and only put together by figures in the Gaonic, but in the Gaonic period, but other ones really developed in the Gaonic period after the Talmud ends. And here you see um, a, just a passage from the uh, from the Seder Tanaim Tana uh an early um, Gaonic work, right, which half of it is made up of these rules. Um, and here you see just some list of them. And you see also um, in the um, Halacha Gedolot, right, at the, at the beginning, and somewhere in this work, the um, the author or the manuscripts at least include this um, collection called Hilchot Kutzot Kutzot Divnei Ma'araba, whatever that might, might be translated as. Uh, but in, again, th this collection that's made its way to Halacha Gedolot is um, is another list of rules for adjudication, right? So it's another important um, byproduct of the Gonic period is these, these figuring out sort of how does one reach legal rulings in, in Talmudic discourse. Um, and then there's one other important discussion that I would like to have. It's a little bit um, controversial among scholars today, but I'll try and offer some of the evidence um, without coming too hard down on this on either side. And that is the role of legal compendia in Gonic works, at least prior to the period of Sadia, who we will meet next week. Um, people may be familiar with a number of legal works and others that are compiled and claim to be um, associated with the Gaonic academies in one way or the other. Here's a few of them, um, probably the best known, the best known ones. Right on the left, we have um, Sheiltot Der Achai Gaon, which is not a halachic collection, um, although it's read this way often, but really is a collection of drashot, a material for drashot um, that circulated um, associated with Achai Gaon in one way or another. Although not all Sheiltot were of Achais, but that's for maybe a different class. Um, we have this work known as the Halachot Psukot. But an early um, work, and you can see the uh, Hebrew here, but I'm going to read the Hebrew. You can see already um, the confusion associated with this work, right? So it's Sefer Halachot Psukot in the middle, right? So it's called the Halachot Psukot, the, defi the definitive laws. Oh, Hilchot Reu, or maybe it's got another title, the laws of Reu, uh, whatever that might mean, Hamu Chasot, which is ascribed the Talmide Rav Yehudai Gaon, right? This is not, uh, this is a 19th century edition, but it's ascribed to the students of Yehudai Gaon. So we already have a big question as to who authored this work and where it came from, um, right? Already on this title page of this 19th century edition. And finally, we have this Halachot Gedolot, which is authored by a figure named um, Shimon Kayara, um, who is a, a name that is basically meaningless. And what I mean by that is that we have this name associated with this author of this work. We don't know anything about this person. Um, so, you know, it doesn't really tell us anything about this work, just describe it to somebody um, who wrote this work. And this work also has its own complicated history. So to what extent can these um, works be considered Gaonic um, in a formal sense that is associated with the Gaonim and the academies and not? Um, so I already mentioned the Halakha Psukot is a little bit complicated. And um, we're not, we'll skip over this discussion, but it is very interesting to note that this Halakha Psukot um, was translated um, in the medieval period into Arabic, um, again, showing you the importance of that language for Jews of this period. Um, but let's talk about, again, what the, um, the Gaonim thought of these works and to what extent these works can be considered Gaonic in the sense of stemming from the head of the academies. And a lot of, there's going to be a lot of ambiguous, ambiguity in the next couple of slides, um, just to show you how complicated this question really is. Someone want to read this chuva that's ascribed to Palto Gaon from the ninth century? I can do it. Please. And that it is written, which is preferable and praiseworthy to delve deeply into the laws or to study halachot ketuot or decided laws. But so here's the question in that question. The question there is, does the phrase halachot ketuot refer to a book, like a book of laws, or just to decide collections of, you know, what we would say like halacha lama aseh, just sort of practical law. So the question is, with, so even in this question, we're not really sure what the question is. Is the question, is it better to study in depth or decided law, or is it better to study in depth or this book of law, right? Not entirely clear, but let's go on. And we would not have asked, but for the fact that most people inclined halachot to ot and say, what need do we have for Talmudic dialectic? Right, this not... question of, you know, how much people should read study Talmud um, is not a 21st century question, um, but a 9th century question, right? 
who cares about the Talmud? Give me, you know, the bottom line law. Maybe that's what we should do. So what does the Gaon tell us? They are not acting properly, and it is forbidden to do so because they reduce the scope of Torah, as it is said, Yagdil Torah v'yadil. Uh, he will make the Torah great and glorious. Right. And the halachot ketuot were not composed for the purpose of recitation, but rather so that if someone who has studied the entire Talmud and is engaged in it is in doubt about something and does not know how to explain it, he consults them. Okay, so this Gaon, then in the ninth century, is telling us that these halachic compendia, um, perhaps of a title halachic ketuot, perhaps just mean groups of decided law, are not what he thinks should be done, right? So it sounds like this Gaon, at least, does not look to works that we think of, like Halachot Sukkot, Halachot Gedolot, as major works of authority. And in fact, if we look at a tshuva that is probably maybe was written by Rav Hai Gaon, um, that's preserved in the Orza Rua, a, um, a, a German um, compendium um, from the 12th, 13th century, uh, 13th century the, um, we have a similar, similar idea. Do you want to just read this one last uh, brief quotation? These halachot of Mar Rav Yehuda, Yehudai Gaon were not seen in Babylonia in the days of Rav Yehudai, but were brought to Babylonia by prisoners about a hundred years after him. I have okay. no idea so, what that means. It's a, it's, a, it's a complicated phrase, but it's potentially very, very important. Okay, so this chuba, which maybe uh, belongs to Rav Hai Gaon, um, scholars are not entirely sure about that, uh, but it's clearly written at some point after the period of Rav Hai Gaon, it, are reflecting on this work that we call the Halachu Psukot that, that I mentioned is ascribed to Yehudai Gaon. And what this author, this author is telling us is that they were not actually written by Yehudai Gaon, but they were, and no and Yehudai Gaon himself didn't have any knowledge of them. Rather, they were brought to Babylonia, that is to the academies in Baghdad, much, much later, right? In what this, to put these two sources together, this response of Yehudai, of Hai Gaon and this one, of, of Paltoy, you get the impression that the Goni were not that excited about the study of applied halachic works. Instead, they were much more interested in the study of Talmudic dialectics and intensive Talmudic study, right? Which would seem to imply then that these legal compendia, if we go back to um, this slide, maybe didn't come from the Goni academies themselves, right? The Goni have a sort of ambivalent relationship to the works such as Halakhuk Delot, Halakhuk Sukkot, they certainly, some Gonic sources, others do, but some Gonic sources don't ascribe Halakhuk Sukkot to Yudai Gaon, all of which implies that these works are not necessarily thought of by the heads of the academies and maybe the students themselves as Gaonic in the proper formal sense. Ra rather, the Gaonim, instead of being interested in works of applied law, like Halakhuk Delot, were much more interested in the study of Talmudic dialectics in a more focused and in intensive way. So just apologies again for the interruptions. Um, let's turn on, I'll turn off the uh, screen share now, and maybe take a peek at the chat, have some time for some questions. Um, if we were to sort of sum up, and hopefully I've answered both questions that we started with, right? The first question was, who were the Gaonim? Um, and we talked about, you know, focus really in Baghdad, heads of the academies from about the sixth, seventh century until the end of the Gaonic period, let's say 11th, century, according to some people, right? Um, and why do they matter? I've tried to highlight some of the important um, aspects of early Gonic literature, right? Emphasis on the Talmud, um, study of the Talmud, promulgation of the Talmud, in that discussion, writing of responsa, um, and then this question of, you know, their relationship to these legal compendia, um, which is a, which is a, a, a fraught question. I'm happy to share some resources on that, um, but without um, sort of weighing or coming down one way or another, it's important to note that the Goni themselves were at least ambivalent towards the study of these works and perhaps um, and perhaps thought that instead of studying, you know, halacha la maaset, simple, straightforward summaries of the Talmudic discussion, one should really focus on the Talmud itself um, and try his best or her best um, to distill and understand the Talmudic discussions um, as they are. So that's where, sort of the, what I hope is the introduction to the Goni. The... Um, we'll take... Time for one where for questions in one second. Am I in, fit into the um, where did the sorry the we'll talk about we'll take some time for questions in a minute. Um the I, the next couple of weeks I want to sort of focus on individual Gonim and um the, from the 10th um, and 11th centuries and sort of talk about their contributions to Jewish literature 
as well. So I see there's some questions in um, in the chat, um, and there may be probably some questions from live as well. So where let me. Um, we, can you tell me where do the stamayim fit into this? So the stamayim is um, is another term for the sabaraim. That would be the figures um, who uh, apparently the figures that um, Shri refers to as the um, sabaraim. That is who the stamayim apparently were. Um, obviously, modern scholarly uh, descriptions of the Stamaim uh, take Shrira as a starting point, but really read that um, much broader um, and do a lot more work in the reconstruction of the Talmud um, than Shrira, you know, sort of using Shrira as the beginning, but go much further um, in that question. The, the question of their role is hotly debated um, and, you know, not really, for, not really my expertise um, other than to say that um, it's a it's an interesting question that um, hasn't really been definitively answered, um, but certainly that seems to that all that discussion emerges really from um, Shira's discussion of the of the Savaraim. Doesn't um, Halivni distinguish between the Savaraim and the Stamaim? He, he he might. I'm sure he does somewhere. Um, I don't think that everyone um, takes um, Halivni on uh, it, it agrees Halivni on all the on all those sort of intricate points. Um, Particularly, I mean, my, my point here is to show you that it comes from Shura, and there are different ways to apply that um, as well. Some people sort of think it's earlier um, than Shura, it's, you know, happened for a longer period. Um, it's a, it's a, it's a hotly discussed it's good, uh, topic that I don't really have time to go into um, at the moment. But yeah, you're right to say that there are a range of positions on that question. Hi, can I ask you a question, which really riveting, mm -hmm. I really love this. I've actually written a bit about the subject myself. However, I noticed that in the map of Europe, you mentioned Luca, which is where Ibn Ezra wrote his commentary, the, the introduction yeah. to his commentary on the Torah, including his very funny critique of Gaonim, which I'm not going to go into. So what I wanted to ask you is, because you know, I visited Luca, um, was it really a center of Talmud at that time? Because that would be very exciting. I hadn't realized. Or was it just on the map big to show you where Rome was? That was just on the map to show you. I think we already just put it on the map to show oh, you. Oh, I see, because Luca was some sort of center here. when Ibn Ezra went there from Spain. And also Haifa, even more, because I taught Ibn Ezra at the University of Haifa and I didn't realize yeah. it was a center, you know. But maybe that was. Yeah, why. I mean, some really... of the figures on the map, I'm not sure exactly where the map comes from, all the details of why each city was I um, identified. I thought, I thought what you did was really good. Or some of it was very new, very new indeed, you know, on, this, on the garden. I think it's going to be a brilliant course. Thank you so much. I'm very grateful. Thank you. Bye. <laughs> any, uh, any further? I can try and take a look at the chat. Um, there's a question here about um, the interpretation of Sopara'a. Um, which we saw in um, the Talmud and in Shura's question, it's a complicated um, discussion as to what exactly means, whether it's authority in terms of caliber of authority or just institutional professional authority. Um, I tried to be ambiguous about that, but I'm not sure. I'm just not sure. The last question also, um, yeah, there was a question about the pseudonymity in this um, chuva associated um, with Haigaon. So I'm not sure. Um, I think generally speaking, in those kind of passages, the question is not, um, is it Gaonic, but which Gaon we are referring to? Um, I think that's generally speaking, right? In this Chuba in particular, there's other evidence outside of the Orzarua um, for its Gaonic provenance, um, but we're not entirely sure which Gaon um, authored the text. Um, I hope that answers some of the questions in the chat. Um, anyway, if there's any more, I'm happy to- I actually was asking about well, we got this book and it says it was written by Yehudai Gaon, but it, was, it wasn't around when Yehudai Gaon was here. So what does that mean? Somebody wrote a book and put that, put his name on it? it wouldn't be the first time in Jewish history. Um, That's yeah, exactly the according, to, it, according to the, so this, the question of the authorship of Halakha Sukkot is um, a rather hot debate um, in this very tiny corner of the academy between um, Professor Robert Brody and um, Professor Nachman Danzig. Um, and Danzig thinks that basically the Halakha Sukkot, um, the description of Halakha Sukkot to Yehudai is correct um, and rereads some of this evidence. Um, and, and Professor Brody says, no, that it's not, it shouldn't be ascribed to Yehudai. Um, among his, what I think is among the stronger pieces of evidence that he gives is that Yehudai, as far as we know, was a very, very conservative figure. That is someone who didn't innovate 
um, proud, was proud to not have innovated in his halachic positions. Um, and Professor Brody suggests that it would be surprising for such a figure to be the first Gaon then to write a work of halakha. Um, I encourage anyone to read um, Danzig's you know, five or 600 page uh, book on this topic if they want to know more um, and make up their own mind. Um, but that is the question, sort of how, how to weigh this evidence and what we should do with each of the, each of the pieces of evidence, yeah. How, how big was the Gaonic group within the total Jewish world? And the second part would be, was it just the, the, the difference in learning between the book of Halakot, Sukkot, and Talmud? Was that a way to keep power in their hands? Others, they don't want books that are easily accessible by accessible by the regular man. They wanted the rabbis to, to, to be interact with, with people when they asked halachic questions, because it really wasn't until the Jewish world was fully immersed in the Islamic world that proper codes were made. And in the, in the Babylonian world, that was still not something that was done. But so your first question is how big were how, they yeah, so I think your first question was how big was the Gonic group? Do you mean the academies themselves? The groups that were uh, affiliated with them, because people like Salo Baron say that even in Maimonides' time, the Karaites were bigger than the Rabbinites. Um, so, and, uh, sorry, for the question of this, the affiliated like today they are, the majority. Right, so the question of um, my impression um, is that most people think that the rabbinic establishment or the rabbinicized Jews were greater demographically than Karaites, although that is a very difficult um, thing to measure and probably differed um, between time and place. Um, the, another, that's a difficult question to answer. A more interesting and potentially much more complicated question is what did it mean to be rabbinic in, you know, um, let's say Mosul in, in Iraq at the time of Nachman Igaon, right? Um, it's not clear, you know, how much access people would have had to have to rabbinic literature and you know, distinctively rabbinic practices. Um, figuring out what is distinctively rabbinic practice itself is complicated. Um, but it seems that um, demographically, I think most people think the Karaites, at least the Karaites, sometimes describe themselves as a minority. So if we could take that at face value, um, we should. Um, but exactly what that meant um, and loyalty to the Gonic, you know, rabbinic Judaism um, was certainly complex um, and not a question that we have definitive answers to um, just yet, although something that's, I think, at the forefront of this scholarly agenda. Um, when it comes to commitment to the Gonim versus other rabbinic authorities, it's also a big question, um, something that uh, is developing and I have some more thoughts on it's a whole another complicated discussion. But, you know, to what extent were the Gonic authorities in charge or what about other local versus other local rabbis that also obviously changed um, over time and place. Um, and then you asked also about the power of, you know, why did the rabbi, why did the Gonim think that um, you should only study you should rule from the from the Talmud itself, right? So this is obviously a long-standing question in Jewish history. Um, some reasons that you suggested are probably correct. That is, it's probably because they wanted to, you know, maintain rabbinic authority. Maybe because they thought that the best way to think through law was through the text themselves, not through summaries. Uh, maybe because you're never gonna, you know, you're not gonna get it right unless you know the sources. All sorts of reasons that are out there, and many of them are offered. Some of them are offered by the Gonim and certainly later Rishonim themselves. Um, but there's a, you know, a big. There's no one answer to that question. I think there's a lot of answers that are probably part of the puzzle there. Any um, any other oral questions? Yes. Um, yes. Right, Mark. So are you saying that there, even at this early date, there was a town versus gown uh, dichotomy? Are there any? I think that. Are there, are there like local rabbis at this point? In yeah, time? I mean, as far as, so we can't really tell um, in great detail, but where we can tell, we can, it, it becomes significant, right? The most important um, center in the later part of the Gonic period is in North Africa, in a city called Kairouan in Tunisia. Um, where figures like Rabbeinu Hananel, Rabbeinu Nisim um, functioned. And as far as we can tell, over time, the, the Beit Midrash um, and the rabbinic authority in Kairouan became more comfortable with itself and became less reliant on the Gonim and more expert in rabbinic literature, right? So this is obviously, Kairouan is not typical because it was a major com commercial hub um, and, is, and has a lot to say 
about um, you know is, is attracted you know, first rate scholars in a way that other cities didn't. Um, but as far as we can tell, as these communities grew, they sort of became more independent from Gaonic authority. This is very apparent um, in the Jewish community in Spain and in, in Al Andalus, um, where Shmuel Hanagid, who was a contemporary of Haigon, a younger contemporary of Haigon, poet, among other many important um, roles that he that he had, um, is very clear that he is fighting against um, the Gaonic, Gaonic authority and sort of trying to put himself on, on that stand. I sort of think that he even may have flirted with the title Gaon, um, which would be quite audacious for him to take on himself. Um, but I don't know if my colleagues all agree with me on that point. But um, yeah, I think as far as we can tell, in these where, where we can tell, the story is fairly clear that over time, local experts became more became greater authorities. Um, but that's probably not representative of the majority Jewish experience, right? We don't have, I name Mosul because it's a, we know the Jews there, we don't know what Jewish life was like. Even in a city like um, Fustat in Old Cairo, where the Gniza is, at this period, it's sort of, and certainly the early part of the Golden period, it's very difficult to know um, what Jewish life was like there and authorities and studying and et cetera, et cetera. And so um, where we know it's interesting, but there's a lot more uh, unknown than known here. Any, um, any other questions? Okay, so thank you very much. Um, my email was on the slide, I closed it, but it's um, hermanm at yorku.ca. Um, I look forward to seeing um, as many people as are coming next week. Um, where we will focus specifically on uh, on Sajid Gaon, um, arguably the most influential of the Gaonim, um, certainly in the 10th century, if not if not beyond. Thank you, thank you again for hosting for Torin Motion. Thanks, Dr. Herman. Thanks everybody for being here. Look forward to seeing you next week. Bye, everyone. <laughs>